Okay, good morning. Good morning. Uh, any new students today? I'd like to talk to you, anyone else? Okay, um, so before we get started with the lecture, um, can you pass your homework to this side of the, of the table so I can pick that up? Also, I sent an email Monday because uh, the final time, the, the time for the final for the final exam was wrong in the syllabus. Supposed to read eight in the morning, eight a.m. So it's gonna be December eleventh from eight a.m. to ten twenty. Okay. I'll probably make several announcements when you get closer to that date, but just keep that in mind if you're planning ahead and put that in your agenda. Yes, we can see what you have. Any other homework? You said, you said the final exam was uh, I guess in the yeah. Any questions so far? Okay, so we, we have a couple of things for today. Uh, today is going to be our formal first lecture, and we're going to start with the introduction to statistics and data analysis. Uh, the material that we're going to be covering today is in, your first, in the first chapter of your textbook. So before I start with new material, I always like to go and review the objectives of this course so you keep in mind what you're supposed to be learning in class. So these are the three major objectives of this course. You want to develop simple graphs and take these over statistics and interpret their meaning for solving engineering problems. You want to use probability models to describe uncertainty and make decisions. And finally, you want to use sample summary statistics to make inferences about the underlying means, variances, and proportions to solve engineering problems. At this point, I don't know if you can understand what those two objectives, the last two, will mean, but you will, you will have a better understanding once we start covering the material. The first objective, um, we're going to start learning about those topics today. So through this semester, I'm going to guide you, I'm going to use this map to guide you through the topics and how are they connected for your better understanding of these four material. So today we're going to start with, as you can see, there's two sides of this uh, diagram. There's probability and statistics. We're going to start with statistics, and today we're going to cover some measures of location and measures of variability. So, as you already know, we're going to be talking about the average, the sample average, of population mean, uh, standard deviation, variance, and so on. So this is going to be part of our first goal for this class. Um, the agenda for the lecture, again, this is material covering your chapter first, first chapter of your textbook. You're going to provide an overview of the statistical inference, sample populations, and the role of probability. We're going to talk a little bit about sampling procedures and how do you collect data. Then, we're going to spend some time explaining or reviewing measures of location, such as the sample mean, um, sample medium, and so on, and measures of variability, the variance, the standard deviation, and if Times allows, we're going to talk about the difference between discrete and continuous data, and this is going to be a topic that we're going to cover next week. Okay, so the learning objectives for this specific lecture, I want you to, to identify the role of statistics that can play in the engineering problem solving process, discuss how biology affects the data collected discuss the different methods engineers use to collect data. This is related to sampling. Uh, understand the difference between discrete and continuous, 
and understand the role of descriptive statistics. So with that long introduction, now we're ready to start covering the material. So, first part of the lecture again is to discuss or provide an overview of statistical inference, samples, populations, and the role of probability in this particular area. So, as engineers, most of the time we're going to be using data to design, to come up with conclusions, to make recommendations. You cannot state a recommendation in your company if you don't have any data to support. So most of the time you're going to be dealing with a lot of data and you're going to have to use that information in a better way so you can provide better support for your decisions. So statistical methods are designed to contribute to the process of making scientific judgment in the face of uncertainty and variation. As you know, most of the decisions that we make are based on um, there has some uncertainty related to it. Um, you are not 100% certain of what's going to happen after this lecture in, in your life. I mean, you can have an idea, but you know that life is uncertain. Okay? So that also applies to what we're trying to teach with statistics. So statisticians make use of probability and statistical inference to draw conclusions about scientific systems. Information is gathered in the form of samples or collection of observations. Samples are collected from population. So it's important for you to understand the difference between these two terms, populations and samples. So, for example, if I want to um, research a specific question, let's say the GPA of all the students at Texas State University. It's going to be very difficult for me to get the input from all the students, which in this case is the population of the, of the, of the university. <coughs> so if I don't have the resources, I don't have the computational power, let's say you want, you want to create an online survey so everyone can go and submit their input, but you know that most of the time not everyone is going to submit their input. So, you're going to have to make decisions based on the input or the information that you have. So that's what we refer as sample. So you're going to collect a sample from all the input that you should have from the population, and you're going to use that sample to make your decisions. So the sample is part of the information that you're taking from the population, and you're using that sample to try to make some good decisions. Okay. So important to understand the difference between population and sample. Okay, so population and investigation will typically focus on a well-defined collection of objects or units. Population is the set of all objects of interest in a particular study. Variables are any characteristic whose value may change from the one object to another in the population. Okay, so variables are also important. You know that you're looking at a big amount of data of information. There will be some difference between the, these units of information. So examples of population objects and variables. For example, this is the example that I just used. All students currently, well, in class, in this particular class, a unit will be only one student. Variables can be the height, the weight, hours of work per week. You are left-handed or right-handed. That can be also the characteristics of variables of each unit. Um, if you look at manufacturing, for example, circuit boards, if you have all printed circuit board for a month, that could be a population. A unit will be just one board, and you have different type of defects, number of defects, the location of defects of your battery. Um, there's two other examples here related to the university. Let's say the all books in library are your population. Single unit or single book will be your unit. And you can have different variables or characteristics for each book. The replacement, replacement cost, frequency of checkout, and so on. So 
these are very basic concepts, but they become very important to what we're trying to explain and teach in this part of the course. Okay, so make sure that you understand what is a population, what is a sample, and a unit has variables and characteristics. Okay, so example, again, is a subset of the population. So let's say this square or rectangle contains all the units that um, contain your population. If you grab some of those units, you can create a sample. And our objective is to use that sample to make conclusions and recommendations for the population, but only analyzing a small sample. Any questions so far? So now let's talk a little bit about what is statistics and specifically descriptive statistics. So descriptive statistics summarize and describe important features of the data. There's two methods. One is the graphical method, in which you can create some diagrams to represent your information, your data. And the other one is the numerical analysis, which is the one that you're more familiar with, uh, I'll think which is when you have a group of information from the data and you can the mean, the standard deviation, and so on. Okay, so we talk about descriptive statistics. Now let's talk a little bit about inferential statistics. In inferential statistics, you use the sample information to draw some type of conclusion. You're trying to make an inference of some, some sort about the population. Okay? So there are several things or methods that we're going to learn, but that will come by the end of the, of the semester. Okay, so we're going to learn the these three methods, and that portion of the course is the material of the third exam of this class. Okay, so what is the role of probability? So we talked about statistics, but what's What's the role of probability at this point to make good decisions and analysis of how well a sample represents a population is necessary to have probability. Okay, so if a lot contains defective wafers, how well will the sample detect it? So let's say you have a lot of printed circuits. This lot has a thousand units and you want to know how many defects you have in this lot. Let's say the, the lot has 20 defective units. If you don't sample correctly, you can grab, let's say, your sample from this 1,000 units, you can grab, let's say, 100 units. But if you don't sample correctly, then you can choose 100 units that are all, well, all good units. So what that sample is going to tell you is that this, sample, this specific lot is good. You have no, no defects. But that's not the real thing, right? So what you want to do is to find the best way to collect that sample from your lot so you can represent what's really happening with the lot. Okay, you want to grab some of the units that are detected as well. And we're going to show you in this course how to perform that at the same time. Okay, so how can we quantify the risk of decisions based on, based on the sample? Probability models help quantify the risk involved in this type of analysis, statistical inference. Okay, so we're going to use probability models to measure to some degree of how good our samples are and how good are they representing our population. So this specific diagram is basically showing up the relationship between population and example and how probability and statistics um, mix into it. So from the population, we can provide some deductive reasoning using probability. So we can collect or get a good representation from the population using the sample. And then we're going to use inductive reasoning or some statistics to 
made recommendations or inferences about the population. So, we have the population, we know we're not, we cannot analyze the, all the units in the population, so we're going to graph the sample of the population. We're going to use some probability models to make sure that we get a good sample. Once we get that sample, we study the sample, we go back and make inference, we make some conclusions about the population, but based on the sample. Okay. Any questions so far with this point? Okay. So let's talk very general about what is a sam sampling procedures and collection of data. Okay, so collecting data, again, if data is not properly collected, an investigator may not be able to answer the questions under consideration with a reasonable degree of confidence. So we can talk about two specific ways or methods to collect data. One of them is called random sampling, which should have any particular subset or specified size, and all the unit has the same chance of being selected. So, say we have this room, all of you are the population that I'm trying to study, and all of you have the same chance to be selected because I'm not dividing you in groups, let's say by gender, or any degree, or any other type. So all of you will have the same chance. That's what we call random sampling. We can also have stratified sampling, and here you have separation separate the population in units uh, of non-overlapping group and taking a sample from each one. So let's say I, I want to divide you by degree, then I can pick from different groups and then you're going to have a different probability of being selected. These concepts, if you are in the IE program, there's a, a course that is called MEPA that is basically focusing on these specific two topics for a whole semester. So if you're an IE, you will see this a lot. Or on that particular course, you will see a lot of sampling and how sampling is performed and so on. In this class, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, those concepts later in the semester. But just keep in mind that we're starting with a population, we're trying to collect some information from that population, and we're going to have some methods for that information. Okay, so now let's talk about the measures of location. So now we're going back to statistics, and I believe for most of you this is going to be a review of these concepts. If not, if you have questions, let me know. I will answer your questions. So let's talk about descriptive statistics. Um, this type of statistics summarize and describe important features of the data. And this is the slide that I show already. So you have two ways, two methods, graphical methods and numerical summary. Um, right now we're going to talk with some deep part of the numerical summary. We're going to compute some statistics and most of the statistics are based on numbers. Okay, so I'm showing this particular figure because I want you to have this concept of population and sampling and samples very clearly, very clear, specifically now for, for the statistics part. Okay, so any of you know the difference between, let me write it here. So in statistics, what is the difference between this symbol and this symbol? So this is mu, and this is x1. Have you seen those symbols before? You know this is the mean, right? x1 represents the mean. Have you used mean for something in one of your courses? 
Critics? Yeah, but that would, that would have a different meaning or, or value of value critics. Nobody? In essence, they're trying to represent the same thing, which is the average. But the main difference is one is called the mean. And that is represented by mu. The other one is called the sample average. So if you have all the units that are part of the study, let's say the population, you have all the information, then you're going to be able to compute the mean because you will know for sure that that is the right number because you are taking into account all the units. So if I take, let's say we have all of you, you are my, pop, my population, and I want to know your GPA or the average GPA, if I take into account all of you, which are my population, and I compute the average of all of you, that is going to be the mean. Because that will not change because I'm taking all the information into account. But let's say I grab only 10 of you, and I compute the mean. Then I'm only grabbing 10 of you that will represent a sample. So in that case, my sample average will change depending on the sample that I grab from all of you. Okay? So that's the main difference. The mean based on the population is going to be fixed because you take into account all of them, all of the units. Sample average is taking this sample. It is computing the mean based on that sample. And it will change depending on the sample that you collect from your population. Okay? So we have also sigma and S. So sigma is our standard deviation for the population. And S stands for sample standard deviation. and we can compute some statistics based on the sample. Those statistics, uh, in this case, are the sample average and the sta sample standard deviation. Statistics is what we use. These are the statistics. It's what we use to compute those measures from the sample. So the statistics are used to estimate the real parameters from the population. So that's the most important part of this. Okay, so we're going to use statistics because we know that mu and sigma will not change. We know that it's, if you take into account all the units, those numbers are fixed. But we're going to use only samples, so the sample, and using the sample and using the statistics, we can estimate those numbers that are coming from the population. We estimate them using the sample average and the sample standard deviation. Any questions so far? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, because if you take into account all the units, that means that you are accounting for, for everything. So it should be more accurate of what's happening in the, as a whole as a group. But if you only take only one small part of it, then you are not 100% sure that you're representing everything. Okay, good question. Any other question? Okay. So, if I, in the exam, if I give you this information, 
you should know that x bar is representing a sample and x is representing representing a sample standard deviation. Um, so you have if I have ten units of something, let's say ten calculators in I give you this. Say so this is weight. So ten units. If I give you that information, I'm telling you you have ten calculators and you have mu equals ten units. Can you tell me if this is a sample or a population? The population. Correct. Okay, so you can tell by looking at the information from the problem if the information that I'm giving you is a sample or a population. Is that clear? It's a population because of the mean. It's a population because this mean, because you know it's the mean, it's few, right? So that means that you're taking into account all the units. Okay. So measures of location provide some quantitative values of where the center or some other location of data is located. So we talked about the sample mean. So again, sample mean takes some units from the population, and you want to compute this measurement that is basically telling you the center of the information. So the sample mean, let's say you take n observations. Something else that you can observe here is that we're using small n here to represent the last number or the last unit from the sample. And you basically compute the sample mean by adding the values of the units, dividing them by the total, which is n. Okay, so this is something that you know already. Now, when you can to see the difference now, uh, this is also measure of location, but now we are looking at the population mean. It's the same formula, but there's a small difference. What is that difference? Can you see what is the difference? You're using capital N. N, or capital N, means that you're taking into account all the units. So N, capital N, that is what it's representing. Okay, another measure of location is the sample median. Uh, reflect the center tendency of the sample in such a way that it is uninfluenced by the spring values. So sometimes, let's say you are studying a particular lot, you're manufacturing icons, and you want to study a lot, and you have a specific unit, let's say from the sample, that Let's say the battery should last four hours, but for that particular unit, it is only lasting ten minutes. If you base, if you use that unit into your analysis, that would affect your center or the tendency of the average, because you have a group of numbers. Let's say from ten units, you have nine that are about the same, four, four and a half, or fifteen minutes, and you have only one unit that is ten minutes. So if you take into consideration that unit, that would affect negatively your measure measurement, let's say the sample mean. So the sample medium basically what it tries to do is to take those extreme values out of the equation and focus only on those values that are similar. Okay? So the sample medium is obtained by first ordering per numbers. You have 10 numbers, you order them in non-decreasing order, and then you count them to see if you have an odd number of units or if you have an even number of units. So the equation that you're going to use is going to be based on the number of units that you have in your sample. So if it is an odd number, 
you take n plus 1 and divide that by 2, and that number is going to give you the order of the unit that you're going to look at to get your sample unit. If you have an even number of units, then you're going to compute n divided by 2, and n divided by 2 by plus 1. You're going to look at the order of your numbers, and you're going to look at the average of those two values. And I'm going to show you an example how to compute this. Actually, two different examples. So let's look at the first example. Um, this one specifically is for the sample mean. So let's say you have this 21 measurements of tensile strength of silicon rubber. And I ask you to compute the sample mean. How would you do? Well, this is a sample mean, not the sample median. So we are, we are going back to the first measurement that we discussed. And exactly. So you sum up the values and divide them by 21. So your sample mean, you add all of them, and then you divide by the total of the that you have. In this case, you have 21. So the sample mean for this is 21.18. Okay, so again, we are using small n because this is a sample. And then you can compute that easily. Any questions? Okay, so can I go to the next slide? Okay. Now, second group of measurements of the same product were recorded. Now I want you to compute the sample median. So again, now we can order those values in non-decreasing order. So that's the first thing that you're going to do. So the lead of order values are here. So again, you start with the smallest one. And then you go up to the largest value. And now you need to count how many units do you have in this sample. So in this case, we have 12. Right? So based on this, this is an even number, so we need to compute n divided by 2 and n divided by 2 plus 1. And let me compute that. So this is equal to 12 divided by 2, which is 6. And 12 divided by 2 plus 1, that is 7. So you go here to your list. This is the value that you want. You count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So you're looking for these two numbers, the 6 and 7 value. So those numbers are 9.7 and 10.4. And again, you're looking at those numbers because you are interested in the value 6 and 7. Once you get those two values, you can average them. So it's going to be 9.7 plus 10.4 divided by 2. So the medium in this case is 10.05. Yes. 
So you have 11, the, the one that is n divided by 2, which is 6. So that number will be 9.7. You don't have to do anything else. Any questions? Okay. Another measurement of location is called the three means, which is computed by trimming away a certain percentage of both the largest and smallest set of values. So again, this goes back to when you have those extreme values and you don't want to account for them, you can take them off of your equation so you can get a more accurate value for your central tendency value. So let's say we want to compute the 10% premium mean for the following samples of steam weight data. So we have two samples. One sample is for no nitrogen and the other one we need. So we have 10 units for each sample. There are, there are two different samples. So I want to compute the 10% premium mean for the first sample. So if you have 10 units and you want to take 10% from the top and 10% from the bottom of this sample, how many units are you going to leave? Or Yes. So you're going to eliminate two of them. The 10% at the top, the 10% at the bottom. So, eliminate the largest 10% and the smallest 10% and compute the average. That's what you're going to do. Again, you're training only 10% and this is only for this sample. Example. I can actually to paint 20%, 30%. But in this case, it's 10%. So that's why we got to train 10% at the largest values and 10% at the smallest values. So looking at these numbers, the value that is the smallest one is 0.28. The largest one is 0.53. So if you delete those two values and compute the mean, this is the number. 0.3975. You are divided by 8 because now you are taking into account only 8 units. You deleted the highest value and the lowest value. So now you only have 8 values to compute the mean. Let's see if you can do the 3 mean for the 10% for the second group. Right. Let me know if you get a number. First person who raise a hand and give me a number get a bonus point for the first. You gotta raise your hand. See me at the end of the lecture. So you do the same process. You go compute, you basically delete the largest number from that sample. In this case, it's going to be 0.86, and the smallest one is 0.26, and then compute the Any questions? Okay. Are these concepts clear? Sample mean, medium, and three mean? Right? So now I want you to create groups of two or three 
because you're gonna have a problem to work in groups and this is the problem and this is going to be your first lab want you to work on parts A, B, C, and E so you don't have to work on part D so don't work on part D okay so group of two or three anybody with a group who doesn't have a group? You guys want to work together? Or you want to work together? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You ready? <laughs> so you have to submit only one paper per group. Make sure that you put the names on top. <laughs> Yes. Yes, use to the small places for your answer. Yes, to the small places. Yes. Thank <laughs> you. 
at the top and 20% at the bottom of your observation. So you first need to order them non-decreasing order and then delete the top 20%, delete the bottom 20% and then compute the average. Sure, of well, your answer. Pretty good. Okay. okay, so I'll give you. We'll need more time. Okay, two more minutes. And we, I'm going to collect the papers and then we'll discuss the, the process. <laughs>
Yeah, and if you can show your work. I mean, I, I don't want you to put just the answer of your calculator. Okay, one minute. Okay, so that's up. Remember to put your names at the top. You want to get credit? Okay, so let's discuss the, the problem. Um, I will decide what to do with this lab after I read it. Uh, if most of you got it right, then I'll put it in as part of your homework. I mean, if only a few of you get it right, so I'll think about giving a bonus point. Okay? So uh, I'll check on it. And I'll get, let you know. Then let's look at the, the problem. So what is the sample size? Any questions about that? So this problem is telling you that you have a sample. And the only thing that you need to do is count the units that you have. So in this case, it's uh, 15. So the answer for the first part is 15. Any questions? Okay, part B. Calculate the sample mean of this data. So the sample mean is represented by x bar. You need to show the summation from I1 to N of all your x divided by N. So in this case, this is 3.4 plus 2.5 plus 4.8 plus dot 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 4.8 divided by 15 so that equals 3.79 questions okay no, that's not going to affect it, but again, the important part about this is the more information you provide me, the more points I can, more partial credit I can give you. So if it's just show me a number and the answer is wrong, then you're going to get zero points. But if you show me your process, I can follow the way you are thinking and I can give you partial credit. 
Okay, so the more information you provide in your paper, the better grade you will get if you don't get the, the answer, the right answer. Something else is, if you show me only the number, then uh, I'll, I can think that you just copy the answer from someone. So please show part of your work. Again, the more work you show, the better chances you have to get partial credit. Um, so part C, calculate this sample medium. So we have the sample size is 15, so this number is odd. So we're going to use sample medium equals n plus 1 divided by 2. So that is the 15 plus 1 divided by 2, the eighth value. So in this case, we have 2.5. 2.8, 2 2.9, 2 3.0, 3.3, 3.4, 3.6, 3.7, 4.0, 4.4, 4.8, 4.8 again. 5.2 and 5.6. So this is the list of numbers or from the smallest to the largest one. And we are looking for the eighth position. So that will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. That is 3.6. So in this case, the sample medium is 3.6. Any questions? So remember, you sort them. This is an odd number of units. So you use that formula. Find the place that you need to find. In this case is the eighth position. And you get the value. Okay? Then part D, how many of you got that one? You don't have to solve that. Okay, so it's part E. I think this was the more difficult one. So now that we have the list of numbers, we can find the 20% of 15. So in this case is 15, correct? So it's three. So we're going to trim the first three numbers and the last three numbers from this list. So that will be these three numbers and these three numbers. So we delete them. And now we are going to compute the sample mean only this, only using these values. So we get three mean of 20% equals 1 over 9 multiplied times 2.9 plus 3.0 plus 3.3 plus 3.4 plus 3.6 plus 3.7 plus 4.0 plus 4.4 plus 4.8 and that is equal to 3.68 So remember, you are not using these six numbers anymore, so your n now becomes 9, no longer 15. So that's important to remember. And then you only add those values that are remain. Any questions? How many of you got the right answer for all of them? Good. That's pretty good.
Okay? So that basically covers the first portion of the statistics that we're going to cover in this class. Now we're going to move, in the next 10 minutes, we're going to move to a different type of measurement. These are called measures of variability. Okay, so you know about the variance, the standard deviation. So those are the measurements that we're going to discuss now. So sample variability plays an important role in data analysis. The control process variability is often the source of major difficulty. So measures of variability includes the sample variance, the population variance, sample standard deviation, and the range. Okay, so again, we're making a distinction here about population sample. We can also make the same distinction here for the standard deviation. So, same thing applies here. The n observations in a sample, we use a small n to, um, <coughs> when we talk about a sample. So if we have n observations, then the sample variance is computed using this formula. So we have x squared equals the summation of the differences of each observation minus the sample average of that square divided by n minus 1. Do you have an idea of why we are using n minus 1 and no n by itself? Okay, so I'm going to explain that in a little bit, but when you look at the population variance, we basically have the same formula, but we use the population mean, which is mu, and instead of using n minus 1, we use n for the population. Okay, so two different measures, one for the sample and one for the population. Population denoted by sigma squared. The sample is denoted by S squared. For the sample, you use N minus 1, not N. So what is this N minus 1? The population value is computed with all the information, which is capital N, okay? Which is the population size. So why we don't follow the same concept? Well, the true variance is based on data deviation from the true mean, which is not the case of the sample standard deviation or the sample variance. The sample calculation is based on the data deviation from your sample mean, not the population mean. Okay, so x, y is an estimate of mu, which is close to the population mean, but is not the population mean. So what we are using is an estimator for computing the sample value. So as you can see here, we are using the sample average, x bar. So we are estimating the variance using another estimator, which is not the case here. You don't have any estimators. You have the population mean. You know that value is fixed. It's not going to change because you are taking into account all, all the values. But in this case, you are basing your estimator on another estimator, which creates some problems. So the sample calculation is not based on the data deviation from the sample, uh, from the population mean. x bar is an estimator. So the n minus 1 resort is used to compensate for the error in the mean estimator. Okay? And that is what we call the degrees of freedom. So the sample variance is calculated with the quantity n minus 1. This quantity is called the degree of freedom. And the origin of the term, there are n deviations from x bar in the sample. The sum of the deviations is 0, which is the balance point. n minus 1 of the observations can be freely determined, but the n observation is fixed to maintain the zero sum. You don't need to understand, fully understand these concepts. I just want to keep in mind that when you compute the sample mean, 
and this you compute the sample mean you're going to be using the sample mean for the variance the sample variance okay so you're using an estimator to compute another estimator so in order to compensate for that error that is going to come from that estimator you need to take one unit from your base here okay so there's two different formulas for the variance one for the sample and one for the population so again if i give you 10 units in one problem give you 10 units and i tell you this is my population compute the variance you will use this instead of this any questions So a sample variance, this is something that I already showed. We can compute the standard deviation by looking at the square root of the variance. And the range is just the difference between the largest and the smallest sample value. So if your largest number is 100, the smallest number value is 20, the range is the difference. 100 minus 20 is 80. That's your range. Okay, so let's compute these, the values for this sample. And I think this is not very clear. So the sample that we are looking at is this one. So we have 10 units. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So 11 units. And we want to compute the value or the sample values. So the first thing you need to do is to compute the sample mean because you know that you need that information in order to compute this estimate. Your sample mean is just the summation of this unit divided by 11 and it's 1.66. So sample mean is coming from this list of numbers and it is 1.6681. Okay, so now we have the sample mean. Well, what else do we need? In order to compute the sample variance, we know the sample variance equals the summation from I1 to N of the differences squared divided by N minus 1. Okay, so now we need to find this difference. And this caused a lot of problems for the students. Because um, some of you do not understand what these back symbols are representing. So what you're trying to find is the difference of each value when compared to your sample mean. So for the first value, the difference is this number minus x bar, which is 1.66, that will give you that number. Yeah, it's a negative value, you're right. But when you, you can do x bar minus xi, it's going to be the same thing for this problem or for this computation because at the end what you want to do is to square those values. So it will be positive number at the end. But you're right, the way I have it here, this should be a negative number. And see, same thing. Now for the next one. Let me check all of them. Let's see. This is 1.6. Negative. Negative. Negative, negative, positive, mm, negative, positive, negative. So the other symbols should be fine. So once you find the difference between each value and x bar, you get this list, then you're going to square all of them. So the square root, the, the square of this is this number, the square of this value is this number, so you do all 
those values for each difference. And at the end, what you want to get is the sum of these numbers. So you want to sum all these values. So the summation equals eleven point three fifty nine. So this sum is this. Is that clear? So again, we are referring back to this formula. This is the sample variance. We need to find the value of this formula. So we need to look at the difference. And then add square each difference. And then add both numbers. This top part of the equation is this number, 11.92. And now we just divide by n minus 1, so it's 11 minus 1, so your variance is 1.19, and your standard deviation is the square root of that number. Okay, so next I have another example. You can work on that example for next Wednesday because Monday we don't have class. And we can discuss that next Wednesday. And you know that Monday is holiday, right? So, you don't have to come. so any questions? Okay, so I'll see you next Wednesday. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. On our lab, we got the first one wrong because you know, made an error. It was this right here. I put 0.25 instead of 2.5. We showed our work. Okay. Um, is there any way we can mark it? Because uh, I don't want my part in that see that in your grade book, send me an email next week, but I'll try to post it to the end. Okay. Um, so, for E, mm -hmm. instead of writing out all these numbers again, I just wanted to say like... Oh, so you put 12 and 7. Oh, this is... Oh. Yeah, starting from 4 going to 12, and then basically... Oh, okay, these. okay, yeah, that's correct. And but for the bottom part, because I noticed that that would only be eight, I added plus one for that error. Is that fine? Because if you were to do 12 minus 4, then it would just be 8. So to get the 9, because there's 9. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that's, that's fine. It makes sense. Okay. 